So in the beginning here, I'm going to be talking about all of the cool things I'm going to be doing to this Les Paul. It's more than just a refret, but it's interesting to hear about some of these other things I'll be doing, and I'll give some tips and tricks for how to accomplish those things, but then the bulk of the video is going to focus on just the refretting aspect of this particular repair. I didn't film the new nut that I installed or the work on other parts of the guitar that I did because I just wanted you guys to see a straight up refret. Hello, hello everyone out there on the interwebs. I've got a Gibson Les Paul here that I'm going to be doing some cool restoration work to here for the owner. First of all, I'll be replacing this plastic nut with a bone nut. I'll be replacing all of the frets with Evo Gold fret wire. And that's just for the longevity of that fret wire, not to mention it has kind of a cool gold look that's going to match all of this hardware that I'm going to be, re be replacing as well, including the tuners. So the owner had a lot of very pitted frets and he wanted to do a full ref refret here, and I kind of talked him into the Evo Gold so that he wouldn't have to do another refret in the future, just again because of the longevity of that fret wire as compared to the, your regular nickel silver frets. Now stainless steel would be an even further jump up in the hardness of your fret wire, but I find that Evo Gold is plenty hard enough to resist getting those pits. And so in addition to the bone nut, the Evo Gold fret wire, and the gold everything else, all the other gold hardware, I'm also going to be repairing this little part of the the top that's going over the body on the cutaway here where it's actually I don't know if you can see that but it's pulling away from the body just a little bit so I have to glue that up without damaging anything else and then lastly there is all this decal work and finish work up here on the front face of the headstock where the finish is just flaking off and the Gibson logo has already fallen off there as I as I touch that you saw uh, some pieces of finish just fly right off right there. So what I'm going to do is score carefully around the headstock, remove all of that flaky finish so it doesn't start to flake out around onto the back of the guitar. And then uh, after that, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. I might um, repaint and finish that whole front face and put the, the decals back on. But the main thing is to keep that flaking finish from continuing and working its way around onto the other parts of the guitar which would possibly necessitate a full refinish in the future if you let this flaky finish stuff just get away from you. And that's pretty much it, so let's uh, go ahead and just dive right into this. So the first thing I'll do since I'm replacing that nut anyway is to remove the nut. Now obviously if you were not installing a new nut and you were just doing a refret, you wouldn't do this. For fret removal, I start with heating up the fret with a soldering iron, and then I'm carefully walking a set of fret pullers from one end to the other end of the fret. You can also use a pair of fret nippers for this, but Stu Max sells these fret pullers now that have a lot of space at the top of them for you to fit your soldering iron in while you're pulling. That way, the soldering iron follows the fret pullers very closely as you walk them up the fret, keeping that hot point right where you're walking your fret pullers.
now that I have all the frets removed, what I want to do is put a, or I'm, I'm going to clean up, I'm not going to put a radius on this because it already has a radius, but I'm going to use a radius sanding beam that matches this radius to clean everything up and bring things back down into level because honestly the neck has twisted um, just a little bit and this is really going to go a long way to setting us up with a good foundation in our fretboard for the fret work. So then once we put the frets in, still going to do something probably to level the frets a little bit, but honestly I might not even need to level it at all because I'm doing my leveling at this earlier foundational stage. So now as much as I like this rifle rest here for a neck rest, it's too soft for what I'm doing. So I'm going to actually replace it with, um, this is basically that Stu Mac fret rocker that you guys have probably all seen, but you know, obviously you can just make this yourself as I've done here, just with some pieces of MDF and some screws. And this way I have a nice, hard, durable platform to rest the neck on and it's got enough length to it that it covers a larger portion of the fretboard so that I can't put any undue pressure in the middle of my stroke here that would throw off the flatness of what I'm trying to achieve. Whereas the rifle rest would just sit at one point here towards the nut and it would be easy to force a little scoop down here further along on the fretboard. So that's why I'm not going to use that. And using a flat bar here in conjunction with the radius beam helps to just speed things up really because the radius beam because it's just moving back and forth tends to track in its own uh, it, it tends to form tracks with the grip particles and more or less just follow those but if I run this shorter leveling beam across like this kind of steadily going back and forth, just like that. Um, that just helps break up the 80 grit scratches from this and speeds up the whole leveling process on this hard ebony fretboard. Okay, so now I've sanded this flat, and I can check it with the straight edge here. And I've also taken uh, one of these shorter wooden radius blocks that I have here and just sanded a little gap. It's really only about a thousandth of an inch in the fretboard tongue area. And that is called fall away because the neck is going to have a little bit of relief in it when the strings add tension to that neck, it's going to pull it forward just a little bit, which is actually what we want it to do. We want it to pull it forward a little bit so that each fret falls away from the one in front of it. That is called relief and it's desirable. Um, when you get over the body of the guitar, that part of the guitar won't be affected by the strings pulling on the neck, of course, right? Because it's over the body. So this part we have to just manually fudge in a little bit of what's called fall away, which is effectively the relief of the guitar as it extends over the body over here. Okay, so you can see this thousandth of an inch feeler gauge doesn't fit in anywhere except down on the end, exactly where we want it to. And that's because I added a little bit with this block. All right, so now I'm going to continue using the radius beam on here, but I'm going to fine tune 
out the grit and actually really I'm not going to use the radius beam anymore. I'm going to use these little blocks just to save sandpaper um, and I'm going to sand this down to 320 grit and then later on it'll get smoothed a little bit further with steel wool. Next, I check the depth of all the fret slots and deepen them where necessary. So through the leveling process, we may have shallowed out our fret slots a little bit compared to where they were before. Also, since I'm using a completely different type of fret wire than was previously in here, the tangs of my fret wire may be taller than the previous fret wire. So all of that needs to be considered because in the end, when you go to hammer in your frets, if your fret slots are not deep enough, then your frets are simply not going to seat. This is one of the, if not the, most important things when it comes to refretting. By the way, I'm using a saw that matches my fret tang thickness, which is 23 thousandths of an inch. Luthier suppliers like LMI and um, I think Stuart McDonald possibly carry saws like this that are made specifically for fret slotting. And the depth checker tool is simply a small piece of the Evo Gold fret wire that I plan to use that I've cut off and filed the barbs off of the tang so that I can easily fit it into the slots. And now I'm filing a slight bevel onto each fret slot. This is really for the future repairman who has to remove these frets again for whatever reason. Um, it's also sort of for me in that when I go to hammer these frets in, if I happen to have a little mistake and one of the fret ends pops up on the other side, if I have those fret slots beveled, then when that fret wire pops back up or when a future repairman tries to remove these frets, that beveled edge really mitigates the problem of chipping on the edge of the fret slots. So when you have a straight 90 degree edge, it's much more likely that when that fret tang comes up and exits the slot, that it's going to catch on that hard edge and pull off a chunk of ebony. So we file a bevel there to prevent that problem. All right, so the radius is set. The fret slots are deepened so that they're deep enough for the fret tang. That's extremely important. And the fret slots are clean and beveled to prevent or at least mitigate chip out at the surface. Uh, so I'm gonna be using Evo Gold fret wire here as I mentioned earlier. And so Evo Gold always comes pre-radiused like this in basically an over radius for pretty much whatever radius your fret board is going to be. Now you always want your fret wire bent to the exact radius of your board or more. So the fact that this is over radiused actually isn't a problem. And the reason it comes pre-radiused I believe just has something to do with uh, this type of material. It doesn't bend easily so sending someone a set of straight Evo Gold um, and then trying to bend that in a regular fret bender, it's a little more brittle so it's going to tend to just break, whereas the nickel silver will easily take the bend. So it's a good thing it comes pre-radiused for that reason. Alright, so now what I'm going to do is cut out individual pieces of fret wire for each fret slot here.
Now to nip off the fret ends, I place a tub underneath where I'm working, which is my metal recycling bin. And that way, uh, as the pieces fall in, either into my hand or onto the floor, they often fall directly into that tub rather than just getting scattered on the floor, which it's kind of hard to locate them and clean them up later on. So it's good to have your sort of trash bin or recycling bin right on hand there. And the nippers that I'm using, by the way, to nip these are ground flush on the front face of those nippers so that I can butt them right up against that fretboard without any worry that I'm going to cut into the fretboard itself. That way I can get those fret ends as close to the board as I possibly can at this stage. And in the next step, I bring the fret ends in all the way by carefully filing them right down to the board. Notice how my thumb is wrapped around the front of the file and basically it rides along the fret tops and that way it just gives me a reference point, something to anchor to so that my file doesn't accidentally skip out onto the top face of the fretboard. Then to bevel those fret ends, I simply turn the file at an angle. So often when you hammer the frets in, sometimes the fret ends, the very end of the fret, doesn't seat all the way. So what I'll sometimes do, I don't do this all the time, it kind of depends on uh, how the fret ends went in. Sometimes I will seat those fret ends a little bit further with a fret press like this. This is the Jaws 2 fret press, Stu Mac. And the radius is a 12 on this, on my fretboard but because I want to really target those fret ends, I'm actually going to use a fret press insert that is a little bit more radius so it can specifically target the fret ends. Because when you hammer in fret wire, the middle of the fret wire always goes in really easy. That's not the area you have to worry about unless you didn't clean or your fret slots or prep them appropriately. It's always those pesky fret ends, and one thing you can do about that is just press them in and then apply some glue. And depending on what level of detail I want to go with this, I'll either just target the frets that I think are problematic, or often I'll just go down the line and do every single fret just because. It takes a little bit longer, but it's nice to know that that glue is in there and that the fret ends are totally secured down. Now if you don't have a fret press like this and you don't want to do this step, I totally understand. In most cases, if you do a good job with the hammer, you shouldn't really need to do this. Most of the fret ends that I'm talking about are, are going to be, the portion of it that's going to be sitting up just a little bit is outside of the lay of the strings anyway. So it's not something you have to get really worried about, like your fret work is gonna be, you know, completely worthless because you didn't press in every end. But if you do have something like this, it's a cool little extra touch. Um, at the very least, the fret ends look more secure, even if it's just in the area that's outside of the lay of the strings. So it just gives you a neater, cleaner fret job, and in some cases, it does actually help avoid those buzzes that you might possibly get on your outside E strings.
And finally, for just a really fantastic dress on the fret ends, I can take this special fret end file and just basically take the burr off of those ends. That's really what you're feeling on when, when you play a guitar and it has that sort of sharp end. That's because they filed the frets and the bevel, but didn't use a small needle file like this to take those burrs off. In the end, I like to really shine everything up with just some 4 aught steel wool. And so one thing you may notice after running the 4 aught steel wool on this is that the gold actually loses some of its gold and sort of becomes chromed out a little bit. Um, I remember the first time I, I dealt with Evo Gold, I was very disappointed by that. But what actually happens is the gold comes back. After about two days, this gold just comes back. I'm not sure scientifically how that actually works. I guess it oxidizes with the air over time or something. But regardless, it doesn't matter, the gold comes back, so it's still going to have that rich gold color, you know, like the rest of this hardware is going to have. Okay, and that's it. Of course, at the end, you're going to have to adjust the setup of the guitar at the saddle and the nut to um, accommodate for the new set of your fret wire. But that's a whole different topic entirely. So for now, I'm done with the refret. And I'm moving on to the other parts of the guitar, like installing the bone nut and fixing up that mess on the headstock. Thanks for watching, guys. And keep building stuff, keep doing repairs, and above all, just keep it real. Bye. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video every Friday. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.